So what are the different factors that were around toward the end of the 19th century that allowed for Zionism to take place? Factor number one um, is what we call um, in history the Enlightenment. Modernity. The idea that um, science, as opposed to religion, rules the world. In order to explain this idea, I've brought in front of you a painting. Anyone here been to London? Anyone been to London? No one's been to London. Have up. No one's been to... Okay, uh, um, in London, in Trafalgar Square, there's the, 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 the National uh, uh, Gallery. And in the National Gallery of Trafalgar Square, uh, you will see this one of these paintings. Um, and um, it's a painting by a man called Joseph Wright um, called A Bird in a Vacuum Pump. And um, it is a metaphor or an image of what modernity or the Enlightenment was. Um, I think we all know as, as products of modern scientific world, what happens to a bird when you put it in a vacuum pump? It's not going to last very long. It's going to, to, to have its last day. And this is what this image is of. It's a, uh, it's a, if you can have a look, can you see my, I hope you can, can you see my cursor go around, highlight? And um, this is a vacuum pump, like a, a glass bell jar with a bird inside of it, with this kind of like duck, uh, 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 what's his name from, uh, from Back to the Future, some kind of like mad scientist, uh, 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 a kind of figure that's looking at us, that's doing this scientific uh, experiment. Uh, where he puts a bird into a vacuum pump and it's going to bat it die. And you've got all these kind of like aristocratic kind of people all gathered around looking at it. And what's very interesting about the, about the picture is where's the source of light in this picture? Unmute yourselves and someone sh uh, join in with me. Where's, what's the source of light in the picture? Where does the, light, where does the people in the, in, the, in the painting's light come from? It's something on the table, it looks like. Right, right, right. It, it's from the experiment itself. The light, the knowledge, light is a metaphor in art for knowledge or understanding or revelation, comes from the science. You've got this little, I'm not sure if it's a boy or a girl, in the background, closing the, 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 the curtains in order to shut out the light from the heavens. In traditional art, the source of knowledge or, re or comes or, or, or enlightenment, knowledge, understanding, comes from the heavens, comes from God, comes along the enlightenment and says, no, 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 no. The source of light isn't going to come from the heavens anymore, but it's going to come from human beings. We're going to do it ourselves. And, um, and, and therefore, this boy is shutting out the light from the heaven. And now the source of light is from, from the experiment. Human beings are going to control life and death. Not uh, God anymore. Um, and look how this, this has such an effect on, on, on all the different people. On the one hand, it's really, really scary. It's totally radical and... and, and, and changes everything that people believe. On the other hand, look how these two people are totally drawn into the experiment and cannot ignore it. This gentleman here is pondering the significance and importance of this, right? It totally changes. Once modernity comes around, modern science happens, um, there's no going back. Instead of God or the church or religion, being in control of our destiny of life and death, humans are. Once that you know, box is open, that box of light opens with modern science, there's no going back. Um, and the question is, why is the enlightenment that is a process that takes 150 to 200 years to out Europe for really to come to, to its forefront? Uh, and I'm going to ask you to open your mics, and I'm interested in, in your discussion, in, in, your, in, in, in your opinions on this. Why is it that you think that the Enlightenment was a critical factor in the birth of Zionism? How, why is it that without the Enlightenment, without the scientific revolution of, 
of, of human beings in control as opposed to, to, to the religion being in control? Why is this a critical element that you need in order to in in, in order for Zionism to, to take place? Anyone? Uh, just uh, unmute yourself if you if you're interested in sharing or got any ideas. There's a like we move away from God during the Enlightenment and from Correct. the church that there's one way of thinking and that like I don't know like rationalism people being um, in charge of their own fate is like comes comes in during the Enlightenment. Exactly. So, so and how is that connected? And finish it off, Nemi. You're hundred percent right. How is that? Finish off the sentence though. How is that critical for Zionism? The Messiah. And why does it make? The, the idea of the, the Messiah, the idea of us waiting for the Messiah or for God to bring us back to Israel. It's this idea that no, like people, we have to do it ourselves. We, exactly. We're not going to sit, brilliant. We're not going to sit around and wait for the Mashiach to come, the Messiah to come, and the shofar glass to blow, and there's going to be this amazing miracle. We're all going to fly on eagles' wings back to, back to the land of Israel. No. If we're going to be redeemed, if we're going to be saved, we're going to have to do it ourselves. So factor number one that enables Zionism to take place is the, the is the enlightenment what's factor number two and this is a trick question factor number two is the emancipation of the jews that took place uh, um, in europe from the end of the 18th century right through to the 19th century the beginning of the 20th century it's where jews were given um, equal citizenship um, of the countries in which they lived there's some amazing uh, 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 years in there for example um uh, uh, not until uh, um, 1917 in Russia, uh, Spain and Portugal, not until 1910, 1911, uh, um, where Jews were given, uh, the, first country, the first country to be given it, where it offered emancipation and citizenship equally to all their Jews were, were, was France. Um, and why is it that the experience of the emancipation, where Jews were given, uh, citizenship of the countries in which they live why is that integral to the birth of zionism why without the experience of the emancipation um by the way sorry i just it, to make it 100 percent clear for everybody when i say just to understand pre-emancipation of the jews jews uh, in all of these con in countries around the world do not have citizenship the laws that they are allowed to live in these countries <coughs> Um, just because of the, um, the, the, the goodwill of their hosts, um, they were accepted as, as kind of uh, alien residents. The law of the land did not apply to them. If you would steal from a Jew prior to the Enlightenment, there's nothing, uh, sorry, the emancipation, uh, a Jew cannot uh, uh, go to the courts because the laws of the land do not apply to that, to, 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 to that Jew. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, comes along the emancipation and says, now we're equal. And the law applies to everybody. Why is it that you think the process of the emancipation was critical to the birth of Zionism? <clears throat> I'm just going to turn on my fan because I'm very... Um, yeah. Anyone, anyone. It's, uh, by the way, uh, it's a tricky one, this one, because it's a trick question. Anyone think, why is it that the experience of emancipation, of becoming equal, is counterintuitive, right? When I feel at home in the country that I live, Germany, France, UK, America, I don't want to go back to some other land, Israel. If I'm now equal and I'm the, the world, it, 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 the, the I have equality, you know, let's take example of countries where you've got great levels of emancipation. Why would you want to become a Zionist if now for the first time in however long, hundreds of years, Jews are now accepted as equal citizens at the end of the 19th, throughout the 19th century. Why would that push someone towards being a Zionist? Yeah, go, Rachel. Um, well, once they were out, then they saw how much anti-Semitism and violence were against them. So it's a double-edged sword and... I, I, I'm going to challenge you because you're right, but I want to I, I sharpen it even more, Rachel. 
yeah, you're right, but, but, but there's always been hatred of Jews. Throughout the Middle Ages, I don't need the emancipation to teach me how much Jews were hated throughout Christian Europe for hundreds and hundreds of years. Massacres, expulsions, uh, uh, forced to live in ghettos, you name it. Book burning, where, spe you know, well, uh, I mean, blood it was very, blood very libels. violent, and they need, they <laughs> saw that they needed a place, and they were also educated then in the emancipation. I, so this is, Rachel, you're 100% right, but I'm going to help you to, to, to formulate. It's the experience of the failure of emancipation that pushes Jews to Zionism. You can pass a law that says Jews are equal citizens. Look at, you've got great freedom now. You can integrate into society, wonderful. And you're still hated? And you're still persecuted? That's too much. I've been waiting all this time for hundreds of years to be seen as equal. And yet I still get slapped? It's not the experience of emancipation working that pushes Jews to Zionism. Right. It's the failure of emancipation which is to Zionism. And then the Dreyfus affair, I think, works its way in somehow. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to get to, I, 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 I'm, I'm getting, that's one of the greatest example of this, is of exactly what I'm saying, is that Dreyfus affair was, and we're going to get to Herzl, but the, the, the Dreyfus affair for those that don't know, a, a, a Jewish French captain that was wrongly accused of treason and that was found guilty, and it was clear that it was only because of anti Semitism, and his name was cleared. He, he was that symbol of an emancipated Jew, a Jew that became like everyone, that did what European society wanted him to do to serve his country and be a good French person, and yet they still hated him. I, I actually want to put, use this example in the reverse. In the United States of America is one of the countries where Jews experienced the greatest success of emancipation compared to Europe. Jews throughout, especially the 20th century, did brilliantly in the States. It's for that reason that the majority of American Jews have stayed in America. Right? It's the truth. Emancipation works. Life is good on the whole. Is that true? I don't know. I'm, I'm, um, I, yes, except we have Charlottesville as an example three years ago this week. Right, right, right. right. I, I'm not denying that. But I, I'm saying, I, I'm looking at the macro, the big picture. Yes, yeah. The, the, the big picture, the big global picture of, of Jewish life in America it, it, over the past hundred years has been good, right? Yes and Jews have flourished in America, and Jews have integrated into life in America. And it's for that reason, most, most don't think, oh, I must go and leave, right? It's we always have our bags packed. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, just in case. Yeah. Uh, but exactly, but it's the experience of, that's why it's a trick question. When emancipation works, Jews tend not to be pushed towards Zionism and pushed towards Israel. It's the experience of the failure of emancipation yes. that pushes them. And why does it push them? You're 100% right for bringing up the Dreyfus Affair. It's because of this new phenomenon that comes about also um, in the 1870s, towards the end of the, of the, um, of the, uh, um, of the, of the 19th century, this new form of anti-Semitism, which is called, mod by historians, it's called modern anti-Semitism, as opposed to, hatred of traditional hatred of Jews. Um, the term itself, anti-Semitism, was created by this gentleman. Um, I normally say to my students, I hope you don't mind me saying this about him, may his um, stay in hell be a hot one, um, <laughs> Wilhelm Ma. Um, uh, he, uh, he was the guy that came up with this idea of, of, of anti-Semitism in, in the modern sense. And the difference between modern anti-Semitism, and this was the big thing, and this is the thing that really pushed Jews towards Zionism, in, especially in Western Europe, was that throughout the history of persecution of Jews in Christian Europe, there was always a way out. If you didn't want to suffer for being a Jew because of hatred of Jews, there was a way out. And it was very, very simple. What was that? 
convert, accept Jesus as Christ, and uh, we're not going to hate you. You're, you, you're even better. That's what they wanted. Comes along modern anti-Semitism. Remember, it's now the, the time of the Enlightenment. Science and modernity dictates the way in which the world works, and not um, God and religion. We still want Jews to be hated for whatever reason. And so therefore, Wilhelm Marr comes up with this idea and says, actually, it's not because of their religion. It's not because they, they didn't accept Jesus as the Lord, Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as Christ, why they need to be hated. It's actually something in their blood. It's actually something racist, it's, it's racial. There's something intrinsically bad about Jews and their culture. It's got nothing to do with the faith that they have. Obviously, the most extreme expression of this is uh, the fascism of, 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 of Adolf Hitler and, 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 and Nazi Germany. Uh, to, to show an example of this, I've got this, this cartoon, this Nazi Germany, German cartoon, uh, children's cartoon, where you've got these uh, very stereotypical anti-Semitic caricatures of Jews, uh, you know, fat and ugly with a big nose. Um, but you'll notice that they're not coming out of a synagogue, they're coming out of a church, and this is their priest, and they're holding their um, Christian prayer books or Bibles, and they've got the rosary beads. Um, but the caption says, even the baptism didn't make him a non-Jew, was the caption. In other words, even if they become converts and become Catholics, become Christians, they're still Jews. They're still really Jews. By the way, just an interesting thing to think about. How many, we all know that six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. How many of those Jews were practicing Christians? The Nazis defined Jews not in terms of their religious practice, but in terms of their racial background. So how many of them do you think were Christian? Practicing Christian. Out of the six million amongst the historians, they see to a million. Of the Jews killed because they were Jews, were actually practicing Christians. In the Warsaw Ghetto, Jews were only allowed to only Jews were allowed to live in the Warsaw Ghetto. There was an active Catholic church, and you could have, if you wanted to, inside the Warsaw Ghetto, celebrated Mass every single day, if you because there was a Catholic Jewish community inside inside the Warsaw Ghetto. In other words, what I'm trying to say in all of this is that modern anti-Semitism comes along and says even if we're going to give you the legal status in our country, even if you convert, even if you emancipate, even if you become one of us, you're still a Jew. There's no escape. There's no escape to anti-Semitism. And, and, and that would, it, it, hence the Dreyfus Affair. Hence the Dreyfus Affair. So we've got modernity, emancipation, the failure of emancipation together with modern anti-Semitism. And yet there's one other, there's, I think, two other factors as well. And that is the birth of what uh, is called nationalism. Uh, comes about uh, at the end of the, a little bit earlier, at the end of the 19th century, 18th century, toward, towards the middle of the, uh, of the, the uh, 19th century, and its climax obviously is in World War I, is nationalism. What is nationalism? What is this idea? It's a modern idea. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's not old. It's a modern idea. And it says this. This is uh, Johann Gottfried von Herder. He says this. Providence, God, has wonderfully separated nationalities, not only by woods and mountains, rivers and climates, but more particularly by languages, inclinations and characters. There's something um, mystical about the relationship between people and a land. There's something that makes the British British. It's, 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 it's providence 
There's something that makes the German people German, the French French, the, the Dutch Dutch, all right? Notice the fact that I don't say Americans Americans because the American nationalism is built on something different. European nationalism is built on this idea of there's something intrinsic to being a German. And it's not just about where I live and where I come from. And this is something, and it's, 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 how does this affect? Why is, it nation, why is nationalism so important in the development of Zionism? Why is it, do you think, that without this, you can't, have, you can't be a Zionist? Or there's not going to be a Zionist movement? The point I think is, is that it was at the exclusion of Jews. It's connected to the modern anti-Semitism. The thing, the, 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 the religious, spiritual, mystical thing that makes a British person a British person does not include the Jew. It's, you're not really British German. And, and by the way, just to get back to the story of the United States, that's why Jews do so well. Why emancipation works in America? Because American nationalism wasn't, was built on the idea and the ethos of immigrants coming from all over the world. It was based on not on, on, on national identity of the connection between the people and the land, but it was based on a concept or an idea that it's true for all human beings, eventually. Um, uh, and, and therefore, European nationalism was an exclusion of the Jews. And basically, they said, Jews turned around in Europe and said, well, wait one second, if all of you guys have got this, all of you guys have got your own sense of a national culture, a national being, a national sense of who you are, we want a bit of this too. We want a bit of this, we want a piece of the action. And if I can't have national identity in Europe, Give me my own national identity. Um, but where is that national identity? Because there's one more factor. There's one more factor that was there. Where does that national identity come from for Jews? It's what we spoke about earlier. The idea that was always within Jewish traditional being, which was this connection to the land of Israel. Traditional approach to Israel, this traditional relationship between the Jewish people in the land. You were a lady who lived in the most, one of the most immense, well-off Jewish communities in the diaspora ever. He lived in the golden age of Muslim Spain. He was, he made it. The Jewish community in Spain when he was living there was the most well-off, well-to-do, integrated, celebrated Jewish community in the diaspora of all time. And yet his most famous poem is, my heart is in the east, and I am in the utmost west. How can I find savour in food? How shall it be sweet to me? How shall I render my vows and my bonds, while yet Zion lieth beneath the, fe uh, the fetter of Edom, and I in Arab chains? I in Arab chains? He wasn't. He was, they had a great life. A like thing would it seem to me to leave all the good things of Spain, seeing how precious in mine eyes to behold the dust of the desolate sanctuary. Even in Spain, the golden age of Jewish life in Spain, Jews have had this connection. And when you put these five things together, that's the magic ingredient that pushes Jews towards Zionism at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. You'd need, it, without each one of these, you never, you're not going to get, the, that's, the magic, that's the magic ingredients. All these five are what's going to push Jews towards uh, towards Zionism. And, um, and it is because of these two, uh, uh, because of this, we have the growth of two very, very great uh, uh, political Zionist, Zionist ideological pillars of Zionism. The first was Herzlian Zionism, or political Zionism. To summarize political Zionism, um, it's basically, to some, and to use the language that we've been using already, he basically said this. 
if you, I have to, I, I put it, I mean to hurt someone. I, I deconstruct hurt someone I mean to hurt. I put him on the, on the, the psychologist's um, couch. And I say, Herzl, Theodore, what do you really, really want? In your heart of hearts, Herzl, what do you want? And the answer to Herzl, if you really scrape away at who he was and what he was about, he really, really wanted to be European. He really wanted to be accepted by European German culture. Before he was a Zionist, he was a playwright. And his mother always told him, that his, you are going to be wonderful, you're going to be amazing one day, Theo, and you're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to be something else. And his plays never took off. That's why he turned to journalism, because if people didn't really want to read his stories, he'd have to write about other people's stories. And um, what he really wanted was, was to be accepted and celebrated. And how could it be? Because mummy always told me that I was brilliant. Mummy always told me that I was going to be the best of the best. So how is it that I failed? The answer is, what do you think his answer was? Why is it that he wasn't the greatest playwright of Central Europe of the late 19th century? Because of anti-Semitism. Because Jews, because of the failure of emancipation. Because I'm not accepted, he experienced that himself. He then sees the Dreyfus affair and realizes the emancipation has failed. And, and, and if you're going to understand political Zionism on one foot or in one, in one kind of one cusp of understanding what Herzl was about, it was this the emancipation had failed for the Jews as individuals in Europe. Therefore, if we can't have emancipation as individuals in Europe, give it to us as a collective. Give it to us as a group. Let us Jews be emancipated into the international community, not as individuals, because that hasn't worked, but let's rather do it as a nation. Let us have a nation. And it's for that reason, in his initial thinking, you didn't necessarily have to go to Israel. In his book, The Jewish State, his pamphlet that he puts forward his Zionist theory, he says Palestine would be good because that's the ancient homeland, but also Argentina would be good. Apparently they have very good beef uh, in Argentina. It would be nice to live there. So uh, uh, Herzl, in his heart of hearts, just wants to be accepted. He never believed that uh, Jews should, uh, that, that the Jewish state should speak Hebrew. That's an ancient... Um, that's an ancient uh, uh, language. He even, you know, he says in the, in, in the Jewish state, how could everyone ever buy a train ticket in Hebrew? That's a biblical ancient language. It could have been done. He wanted it to be European. He spoke about the, uh, the Jewish state being a bastion of European culture against the barbarism of the East. He was, uh, right. And the point I want to make about Herzl is that I want to ask this question is, do we think Herzl was revolutionary? When I've explained, the whole, going through this whole process of understanding the context of, of why Herzl becomes a Zionist when he does, all of those factors that, that, that bring about Herzl, the question is, was he really revolutionary? What are your opinions? A revolution is a radical departure from the past. I'm going to get rid of everything that was and create something totally new. All good revolutions have a guillotine. Get rid of the old to recreate the new. I, I would argue, and uh, you can discuss this with me or disagree with me, I want to argue that Herzl was not revolutionary. He was the dreamer, he was the thought behind the Zionist movement, he was the person that made the Zionist movement into what it was, into a political organization. But in terms of his philosophy, I, I, it wasn't particularly revolutionary. He was only a product of, he was a product of his time. 
Jews were not accepted as individuals. Give me national sovereignty. Give me national emancipation instead. In my opinion. Equally so, I would say that his counterpoint within the Zionist world, um, cultural Zionism of this, the other gentleman on the slide, Asher Ginsberg, who's known by his pen name of Achad Am, was, I don't think he was revolutionary either, even though he was opposed to the political Zionism of Herzl. Uh, Asher Ginsberg, Achad uh, Am, um, basic thesis was this, he said, a political sovereign state for the Jewish people is never going to solve the problem of emancipation or solve the problem of modern anti-Semitism. It's never going to go away. Even if we have our own state, it's impossible that all Jews from around the world are going to come and live in this Jewish state. So, okay, so maybe it might be good for some, but it's not for all. So it, that's not the issue. And Achad Am turned around and said, actually, what Zionism is, is not about politics, but it's about culture. And it's about identity. Achad Am was a product of the Jewish Enlightenment, Haskalah. He was brought up in a very, very traditional religious home. And at a certain point, he, he, was, he was a child genius, uh, taught himself Russian, and eventually started reading the great philosophical works of the Enlightenment, of modernity, and eventually took his kippah off and became secular and rejected traditional Judaism, rejected mitzvot, prayers. Humans are in, what we spoke about before, Enlightenment, modernity. Humans are in control, not God, said Achadah. And yet, Achad Am still wanted to be and live a genuine Jewish life. He wanted to, this is the crux to cultural Zionism of Achad Am. On the one hand, I'm secular. On the one hand, I've rejected traditional Jewish life. I don't keep mitzvot, I don't keep Shabbat, I don't keep kashrut, I don't go to the synagogue anymore. On the other hand, I want to be genuinely Jewish. How can I do that? His answer was Zionism. He turned around and said, the only way that I can have my cake and eat it, if you like, be a non-believing secular Jew with a genuine, authentic Jewish life is through Jewish national identity through Zionism, through living in our ancient homeland, developing our own culture with our own language and our own society where, where books and newspapers and cultural events were all in our, was a part of the whole, it's the, whole, the whole package of life. Not just the synagogue, but and not just, you know, ritual, but everything in life becomes Jewish. That is what is going to allow me to be both a secular non-believer, someone that does not believe in God, and at the same time be genuinely Jewish. This was Achad Ha'am. In order to, uh, I often use the metaphor of, uh, to understand the difference between Herzl and Achad Ha'am of cake baking. What do you need to bake a cake? You need the ingredients, and you need a tin, a cake tin, to put, otherwise it'll make a big mess in the oven right? Herzl was all about the cake tin. We need a framework to hold us. We need a frame, we need a state in order to protect us. What kind of cake, what kind of cake we have in, I don't really mind. So long as if I'm free to be, I've got a framework, a state to look after me. If you ask Herzl, I'll be European cultural. Doesn't really matter. Chada Am turned around and says, it's not about the cake tin. The cake tin's irrelevant. No one thinks, oh, that was made in a wonderful cake tin. They say, oh no, that was a wonderful cake. That was a cheesecake. 
Well, it's not about the tin, it's about the ingredients that makes the cake. I want my cake to be a Jewish cake, said Hadam. Not, it's not about survival. It's about, it's a, no, sorry. It is about survival. It's not about physical survival or political survival. It's about cultural survival. How can I still be genuinely Jewish and genuinely secular? His answer was Israel and Zionism. And I would still want to ask this. Uh, um, anyway, uh, by the way, just for what it's worth, my opinion, Herzl was the Zionist of the 20th century. 20th century was the year, the, de the, the, the century in which Jews experienced the highest levels of anti Semitism. And therefore, there's no way that we could be as a Jewish people without the state of Israel. I think the 21st century, hopefully, isn't going to be about the physical existence of the Jewish people, but the spiritual Jewish. But the, not just about the physical existence of the Jewish people, but the spiritual existence of the Jewish people. What does it mean to be, I don't want to, I don't believe it, I'm not religious. I don't want to go to shul. I don't want to pray. But I want to be genuinely Jewish. That, that's the question that the Chadaham has. And I think that's the question of the Jewish people in the 21st century. As opposed to the political Zionism of the 20th century. Um, but anyway, I'd still like to, would 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 argue that Achad Ha'am is not revolutionary as well. He is basically also a pro He's a product of his times. He's this product of saying, "I I I, I want to find a way of being Jewish in my time." Okay, let's have let's have a national homeland. Uh, 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 in the la in our ancient Oman, great. But I don't believe he's revolutionary. The real revolution of Zionism, in my opinion, really takes place subsequently, after Herzl and after Achadah. And it's during the time of what is called in, in, in Zionist history, the second Aliyah. Second Aliyah that starts in, in 1904 and lasts for 10 years until the outbreak of World War I in 1914, was a wave of immigrants that came mainly from Eastern Europe um, um, as a wake of terrible pogroms in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. They were also very much influenced by the beginnings of socialism in Russia and Marxism and the beginnings of the, the socialist revolution that's going to take place. And in the wake of that, they decided to come to Israel in order to totally revolutionize what it meant to be a Jew. Um, one of the greatest um, expressions of this revolution was through a very famous, horrible poem written by uh, one of Israel's most famous poets, Chaim Nachman Bialik. He was a student of the Chadaam, member of Chovu Beit Sion, that in 1903 was sent to a town called Kishinev, uh, where in 1903, in April 1903, there was a terrible uh, pogrom in which 49 Jews were brutally murdered. And he writes a poem and he, oh, sorry, and he was sent there to Kishinev in order to investigate what he saw. And he writes a poem called The City of Slaughter, in which he describes and create the Jews of Kishinev that, that were victims of this, of this uh, terrible pogrom. And um, it's a terrible, horrible, horrible poem, um, where he describes how passive and weak and pathetic the Jews of Kishinev were. As the, as, the, as the women were being raped, the men were hiding behind barrels, watching, um, not doing anything to protect them. There were these weak, passive victims. And comes along the Jews of the second Aliyah and say, we want to destroy 
this old Jew, this old, weak, religious, passive, uh, pathetic Jew that's not going to stand up on their own two feet and take control of their own destiny, but is just this weak, you know, victim. We're going to destroy that. Every good rev revolution has a guillotine. Get rid of that. And we're going to create what's good, what they're going to call the new Jew. Hayyehudi hachadash, the new Jew. The tagline of the Jews of the second Aliyah was, Anu banu arza, we have come to the land, live not, to build, to build the land, Zionism, ulahi banot, and to be built. Not only are we going to build the land, we are going to rebuild ourselves in a new image, in a new way. And this is the, really what was the revolution of Zionism. This was the Zionism of, of, of saying, we're going to build something new. Now, one of, in order to ex explain this revolution in the, in the minutes that we have left, I want to show you this book that I have. It's, it, it's a lovely book that I found a little while ago. It's called um, Visual, uh, Blue and White in Color, Visual Images of Zionism. And, and it's basically a book of Zionist uh, propaganda posters. And in it, I've selected a few that really show us this image. If Bialik creates this um, stereotypical image of the old Jew, what I want to paint for you now through these images is, are the images of what this new Jew is, what this new idea is. So let's have a look and see what we've got. This one is a, a um, front cover of a Zionist uh, journal called Hakeshet. In the bottom left, you've got the, uh, the um, uh, what's it called, the, 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 the contents of the journal. And this was the front cover. What's interesting about, who can, let's do this one together. Everyone have a look. Why, why is, what's revolutionary about this image in, within a Jewish context? Who is leading who in this poster, picture? Who's leading who? You've got two people. Who's showing who the way? The young, strapping, buff, half naked, not very Jewish image having half naked men with the, with the muscles, uh, um, is leading the way to the old Jew. The young are going to lead the way, not the old. In traditional Judaism, we always have this idea of reverting back to the tradition. It's the elders. I am defined by my heritage. My name is Yaakov bin Yamin ben Gershon, the son of Gershon. I am defined by my past. Comes along Zionism and says, no, 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 no. It's not going to be the old leading the way. It's going to be the young leading the way. Idea number one of this new Jew, youth leadership. Ah, I love this one. This is an amazing uh, 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 poster. This was the poster that was put on the front cover of the brochure of the sixth Zionist Congress of Basel in Tafresh Samach Gimel, which is equivalent to 1903. And the tagline of it was Hazorim Bedima Barinaik Tzol. Those who sow in tears will reap with joy. And reap in joy. And what's amazing about this is that does anybody know what was the hot topic of the 1903 Sixth Zionist Congress of Basel? Does anybody know what was discussed in that Zionist Congress? That was the year of the famous Uganda debate. Anyone remembers that the, the Herzl put forward this idea of, uh, of Jews going to uh, Uganda 
uh, in Africa as, a, as an immediate response to the pogroms of 1903. And the British came up with the idea and it was a massive, massive debate. While they were debating that subject, should we or should we not go back to the land of Israel? This was the image on their laps, on, their, on the front cover of the, uh, of the brochure uh, of, the, of, the, of the Six Zionist Congress. And, and it, showed, it was a done deal. They were never going to accept Uganda. Why? Look, what's the sec this next idea that's found of this new dream? Look where the redemption comes from. Look where light comes from. This heavenly figure of this angelic, angelic, winged kind of goddess. I don't know what. Uh, uh, where, do, where is she coming out from? She's coming from the sky, from God. Where's the light coming from? From heavens? Where's God coming from? Where's the light coming from? The ground. The, the wheat. The earth. Our redemption is going to come through working the land. We're going to work the land ourselves. If we rely on others, it's never going to get done. Um, so that's that. Next um, is another wonderful one. Uh, again, it's this relationship to the past. And Jacob shall return and none shall make him afraid. Look at these young, active, healthy Jews. By the way, this old Jew isn't a Jew from the past. It's, um, it's, 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 it's Jeremiah. It's the, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the, uh, what's it called? The, 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 the prophet showing people the way, look, you're going to go back. A wonderful image as well. I love that one. Um, oh, this one's good. Uh, this is brilliant for the JNF. Youth Settlement in Palestine, Jewish National Fund, 111 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Are they, is that, is anyone, no, is that still, are they still the address of the JNF today? Do they still have premises on Fifth Avenue? That would be cool if they do. I don't, anyway, um, and it's an advert for land for youth. And um, it's, sorry to say this, I know it's the middle of the afternoon, um, and, and, and it, it's very, very sexual, this one. Um, uh, lots of sexual imagery. Come to, come to Israel, where everything's healthy and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and youthful, and you can roll around in the hay and have a nice time. And um, this is it was this was this was this is what was going to draw young people to come to live in Israel. Instead of the 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 old um, stinted sexuality of the diaspora, this is young, healthy. Anyway, that's uh, oh, this one obviously is 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 the clear image of the new Jew. Uh, a nation reborn on its ancestral soul. Look at those big, huge muscles of this, this young farmer uh, that's in control, that's confident, that's looking out, not down. Oh, this is a good one as well. You may be Alec. This is a worker. This is, uh, by the way, an advert for a, uh, a, 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 a what's the word? A, a, a poetry festival called Yemei Bialik in, in Germany, if I'm not mistaken. And look at this, it's, amazing, it's called Yemei Bialik, the days of Bialik. And it's amazing because you've got this worker, he's got the worker's cap and he's, sitting, he's, got, his, and he's got his spade next to him, but he's, in, but he's, he's learned, he's intellectual. On his break, He's reading a book. He's not just sitting around playing cards, smoking a cigarette, hanging out with the other with the other people. He's reading a poetry. The new Jew is a worker, but he's also a, a cult, interested in Jewish culture as well. Um, this is an interesting one because it's a it's the exception to the rule. It is a stamp that was sold in order to raise money for a youth movement called B'nai Kiva. And the tagline of B'nai Kiva was Torah, 
don't know if you can see the word Torah there. Va'avoda, and work. Look at this young man. During the day, he works, and at night, he studies. So there's interesting that within this new Jew, there were those that were also, they were very much so in the minority, but there were also those that, that, that were still religious. Um, this one is an advert for a Maccabi event. And look at that very, 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 very Jewish looking man, but yet very un-Jewish body. This is not someone that's been eating lots of cholent and giggle. And uh, this is, you know, a fencer, very strong, powerful physique. And, and, and Zionism re wants to recreate this image of this Jew, this, this sporting uh, 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 an, an, an image. Um, I've got this one as well. This is, it's, look at this, it's called Dmei Chanukah, the value of Chanukah. And you've got this young pioneer who's on, on the one hand holding a plow, he's a farmer, but on the back of his shoulder also is a rifle because he's also a fighter. And look at his muscles and his short shorts, and, he's ready. and he, he's gonna farm the land and he's gonna fight. And what's interesting about him is look who he's in the shadow of. He's in the shadow of a uh, Maccabee fighter from the story of Hanukkah. It's not that the Zionists wanted to get rid of their relationship with the past. They liked the past. The point about it was is that they had a selective memory of the past. Who from the past did they want to emulate and who did they not want to emulate? There's the value of Hanukkah was very, very strong and popular. Because these were Jews that were fighting back, back against the evil Seleucid Greeks. That is someone to, to and by the way, interestingly in, in Israel, interestingly in Israel, um, Hanukkah was always traditionally the very most popular festival and Purim not so much. Only comes about later during the fourth Aliyah and Jews from Poland come to Israel and, and Purim becomes popular. Why? What is Purim? Purim's the ultimate survival story of the diaspora. How did Jews survive the evil decree of Haman? By the Jewish beautiful princess using her sexuality in order to, 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 to get the Jews to be saved. It's, it, it's anti-Zionist story, the story of Purim. Hanukkah was Zionist. Okay? And um, I'm going to end and there. Um, and, and what I really want to say is that, it, it's as a conclusion, is that this idea of Zionism as a revolution, although it was very much, it, it, it was an evolution that brought about a revolution. The Zionism at the end of the 19th century was, was evolutionary, was a process that took place. Herzl and the Chada'am were products of their time. The revolution, though, takes place when Jews come back to the land and rework what it means to be a Jew. And uh, that, I think, is, is, is one of the most wonderful ideas about Zionism and what's so, such a bracha and blessing of our times, that um, we've all got this ability, and please God, uh, uh, um, the corona will go away and everybody should be able to... to, to, to um, come back to Israel as quickly as and, and, and most often as you can so that you realize that we can have this true relationship with Israel and why by coming to Israel and being in Israel we can con in having this freedom and ability to to uh, to redefine who we are um, and, and, and create and be masters uh, uh, and, and controllers of our own destiny so that I think is, is, is the Zionist revolution um, and that's all I had to say for this evening. So.